so there's probably there's probably three words in this title which are causing people some despair, but thankfully, uh, uh, Hell has uh, very kindly defined historiography, so we're down to two. Um, uh, Byzantine here refers to the uh, surviving surviving eastern portion of the Roman Empire centered around Constantinople. Um, which, depending on your definition, existed between uh, the 3rd to the 6th century to the uh, 15th. Um, uh, and hagiography uh, is uh, an, basically, hagiography recounted the lives of saints for the sake of posterity. Uh, the content of these works were shaped by the existing cults which these figures had attracted, uh, and also uh, sets of topoi, or tropes, motifs, uh, or according to many historians, clichés. So these literary conventions, which would uh, appear again and again. Um, the examples on the screen include kind of being tempted by a devil, curing sickness caused by a demon. Uh, and as you might be able to tell, a lot of these are very kind of centered around uh, Christ's life and uh, kind of figuring the saint as an imitation of him. Uh, these works were written and read as one example of veneration of the saint cults. These, in these also included feast days, prayers, the creation and use of iconogra iconographic representation, uh, and pilgrimage to these figures, resting places, where often miraculous healings would, uh, would occur. Uh, so they're shaped, they're kind of both, both sort of reflective and formative of people's cultural norms, given these, were, these figures were kind of, these figures were ideals and kind of set out theological <coughs> norms, uh, but were also, also written in accordance to what people already uh, believed about these, about these saints. Uh, very rarely are they kind of completely fictional creations. Um, so today we're going to be dealing with one uh, topos in particular, which is that of cross-dressing saints. And this is an open uh, The cross-dressing saints uh, are, are kind of quite quite a common feature, as we'll get to later. Hmm? Come back to the beginning. Um, but firstly, we need to look at a firstly we need to look at a third century uh, a third century set of canons. Uh, from the Synod of Gangra, which was a collection of uh, church hierarchs, um, in which, as you can see in these uh, these four canons I've given to you, uh, various uh, various social up socially upsetting uh, customs, including uh, female cross dressing, as you can see in 13 and uh, then in 17, uh, were forbidden. Uh, 17 refers to tonsuring, which is a kind of very Monastically associated thing. So now we're going to we're going to examine three saints who uh, did not oblige. Uh, so uh, Mary Marinos is a fifth, sixth century saint uh, who entered a male monastery at a young age under the, uh, uh, taking the name of Marinos uh, and initially uh, being mistaken for a eunuch. For a time, she lived there unsuspected, and then somehow or other was accused of fathering the child of a barmaid. There's probably some research into how a eunuch could have been accused of that successfully, but she was. Uh, and at this point, she was uh, cast out of the monastery, uh, raising the now abandoned child, which is Barmite, kind of pearls at her feet, uh, and uh, and having his or her uh, robes uh, kind of soiled, soiled by it, and then uh, and then and then reinstated um, by her former brothers as the lowest among them. Um, now, uh, the last point here is that Marinos was, re uh, Marinos was revealed uh, to have originally been Mary uh, only after their death. Uh, and as we can see here, Prezi obliges, uh, this, this kind of revelation uh, was not one which was met with, uh, met with horror, but after initial surprise, um, there was a miraculous occurrence where the abbot uh, was forgiven by the, by the now disembodied saint. Uh, and uh, this having been done, uh, the uh, the group proceeded to to bury her with, with much fanfare and in a kind of a, a very positive light with this kind of exceptional uh, exceptional uh, divergence from gender norms sort of being being treated as, as something to uh, to meet with glory and, uh, singing of happy psalms and hymns as we can see in that um, extract. So the next one is uh, one of the most common examples, uh, one of the most commonly uh, common, commonly examined examples of hagiography, and not for no reason. Uh, this is Pelagia, uh, known as the Harlot. Uh, she is also uh, known by several names. The first of which is Margarito, which she, uh, in, she, she employed as her, as her name during her, her very successful career as a prostitute. We can see here that uh, she was all, already kind of presented in this, in this point as being a kind of manly in her, in her posture, in her manner. Um, but in this, in this case, a more kind of negative, uh, uh, negative light than we'll see later in her life. Um, uh, uh, 
at this point in this, this, this tale is narrated by, uh, it was purportedly narrated by this deacon Jacob, who is an accompanier you know, of, a, of a holy man, another saint called Saint Nonus, who is a bishop. Upon encountering, uh, encountering Palladia, whose description we saw there, uh, or Margarito at this point, uh, he is uh, duly overcome uh, and, um, and to the slight bafflement of his fellow bishop starts to tell them that she's a figure that they should be emulating and, uh, and perhaps they should even be her, her pupils. So, um, <coughs> so this, uh, this, this, can, this uh, kind of continues on for some time with him explaining how, how unworthy he is uh, as compared to this uh, very effective prostitute. And uh, at, this, uh, at this point, he, he gives, a, uh, he gives a, a strong sermon, which um, she, for some reason or other, shows up in the church and is, is instantly converted by. Uh, and this is just a further description of her fineries, um, which the hagiographer, for some reason, devotes quite a lot of time to. Um, so, uh, after her conversion and scaring off the devil, as you do, uh, she was uh, she was given the robes of, of Bishop Nonus uh, and uh, adopted them as her own uh, before taking off to become a holy man, which he is aware of. Uh, our narrator, however, is not Deacon Jacob. Uh, many years later, travels off to Jerusalem, uh, and and uh, again uh, we see uh, the saint passes perfectly despite having despite having met her and uh, and, and and had kind of. A significant experience with her. Anonymous is incapable of recognizing Pelagios, uh, the very cunningly uh, renamed uh, figure, as uh, this form of Pelagius. So again, we have a we have a a kind of perfect passing. Uh, no one suspected anything. Smell you because a renowned monk, perfect and righteous disciple of Christ. <coughs> so again, this uh, funereal arrangements occur, and uh, Pelagius is discovered uh, with uh, with initially the hierarchs trying to conceal it. Uh, and then, once it's realised, uh, a massive procession for her, uh, and a kind of biblical reference there was nothing in. So these lives are following a rather typical progression for the top boy. The revelation of the transformation follows the death of the saint, with their having passed until the end of their mortal span. Uh, upon upon their death, their womanly state is discovered, and is then the case uh, is then the cause for jubilant memorials. Uh, in Pelagius' case, this is actually initiated by Bishop Nonus, um, who actually is, is recounted as founding the feast. Uh, in the narrative. So, uh, our final example, which we're going to deal with today, uh, doesn't, doesn't treat uh, cross-dressing as a culmination or as a kind of perpetual lifestyle uh, for all of all the narrative as, as in the last two we've seen. Um, but instead, uh, Matrona of Perge, who, yes, Matrona of Perge, who we're flipping to here, unfortunately I've not titled this one, but there we go. Uh, Matrona of Perge, uh, is also a figure who uh, also a figure who took to male dress. In this instance, uh, she was a married ascetic whose husband uh, Demetianos mis mistook her time-consuming devotion as her departing off to work as a courtesan. Uh, as such, she forbid her from taking these excursions, uh, and she responded by offering her child up to adoption, fleeing her marriage, tonsuring, and cross-dressing to disguise again uh, as a eunuch monk. Monk, um, and as we can see here, she's described as being completely transformed into a man uh, under the name Babalas. So, uh, we should just have a quick run through. These, this is just the, the um, uh, she, she's, in, she's in fact discovered uh, and uh, then goes on to proceed uh, encountering, uh, encountering now as a woman, this demonic presence uh, which uh, attempts to transform itself into a woman in order to entice her out of the desert and into Beirut, the city. So, uh, she rebuffs him and then continues on through her life, saying she doesn't seek to the body. Uh, so, the uh, the significance of these works is not uh, is not as kind of an, uh, an isolated uh, like a few a few scattered and isolated examples. Uh, there are at least a dozen uh, particular saints whose lives who who are considered to have featured this topos. Then, with many more vita written about them, uh, they spanned the late antique and early medieval periods and were composed in Greek, Coptic, and Syriac in the East, which is what I'm dealing with here. Um, this trend, this trend had largely drawn to a halt uh, by the 9th century in terms of saints actually having been considered to exist, but these works were being rewritten constantly uh, from the 10th century onwards. Um, and some of these figures, uh, including St. Pelagia, remain figures uh, of veneration uh, for the Eastern Orthodox Church to this day. This trend has duly received a considerable amount of attention from historians, 
Um, and having kind of just expressed the range of ways in which hagiographers use these works, I'm going to move on to talk a bit about the historiography. So, um, uh, Marjorie uh, Garber mentions her in pa passing, but what we're mostly going to talk about here is um, si Sister Benedict Award uh, SLG, who's a member of the uh, Sisters of the Love, Love of Grace, uh, the Anglican community. Um, she, uh, she did an, uh, a large amount of work, mostly in the 90s, referring, uh, kind of dealing with these figures, uh, and, I th and I think that's best seen against the backdrop which were going on within the Church of England uh, at that time regarding women's place in the church, uh, and especially the priesthood. Um, so against this backdrop, uh, the cross-dressing monks were cast as rebellious figures from the church's ancient past, a kind of uh, uh, pre-Catholic heritage, I suppose. Uh, similarly, the works of Gillian, uh, Gillian Clark are sought to preserve so they kind of sought to present Christianity as a force which vastly expanded the prospects for women of late antiquity. Um, now, while the broad contours of this trend are, are ones I agree with, this is kind of a move away from this kind of uh, classicist's presumption of Christianity as this debasing force which kind of made things crude and simplified and, and sort of uh, late antiquity as this, uh, this kind of admixture of chaos, unease and decay for all concerned. Um, they, there's this kind of a shift towards uh, late antiquity as this positive, sophisticated uh, uh, era worth studying in its own right. Um, now, uh, while that's true, I'm just going to take, so this, this, is, um, this is perhaps a typical example of, um, uh, Christ, of the existing hagiography, which kind of describes them as uh, sort of transcendent figures and describes them as transvestites, which is the point we'll return to. So this, um, this kind of vision. Uh, the last sentence is especially, uh, especially important, but we'll return to why that is. So, uh, while this is, um, while while you can kind of see them in, in this light, uh, it's rendered uh, a little. It, it's it's kind of it's not exactly unproblematic ballast for feminist uh, feminist accounts of church history. Um, we are going to move on to a quote from Linda Kuhn, which I think exposes why that is. So, this, the especially with Pelagia, uh, the issue is that um, rather than uh, presenting these presenting these figures in an entirely, uh, their, their femininity in a positive light, what the positive uh, facet of them is, that they're, that they're, is that they're able to escape their womanhood. Uh, they can become men uh, by abandoning uh, their female attributes. Um, similarly, uh, Castelli's uh, contribution to the excellent bodyguards collection, which is uh, basically a necessity for any strain of queer historian, which, uh, queer, queer historian, which is entitled I Will Make Mary Male, uh, suggests that this ideal originated from a transcendental ideal, which is basically uh, this, this uh, abandonment and femininity and becoming male uh, forms this kind of path to holiness for people uh, through kind of abandoning worldliness. Um, and what this is uh, on the screen, you can see this is about this kind of idea of ensoulment, where the Aristotelian conception says that there are, there are two different types of soul, male souls and female souls. This kind of, old, this kind of uh, older platonic uh, understanding uh, suggests that uh, the, basically, the, the gender is sort of a, one part of the worldly. So, if you're ascetic enough, you can uh, just escape it. So, um, this uh, in this context, you have uh, you have additionally this idea of manliness and virtue, and, and vir being virtuous and being manly had become the same thing in the Greco-Roman context, which was directly inherited by the uh, Byzantines. So, there, so the the issue is that. These figures have often been cast as transvestites, although this isn't universal among historians. Uh, there's been a shift in recent years towards describing them by their behaviour, uh, just describing them as cross-dressing, or perhaps the deployment of scare quotes uh, that is calling them transvestite monks. While this is to be lauded, the exact implications of these various terms uh, is not something I've seen explicitly tackled, and I think it's important to kind of outline why why transvestite is wrong, not through pedantry but through kind of um, historical. Uh, correctness. Uh, the, so the, the transformation in these narratives is not uh, always simply limited as a woman taking on man's clothes, as we've seen Matrona is described as becoming completely transformed into a man, um, and it's kind of conflation to suggest that uh, all of these lives shared this, this, kind of, this kind of same exchange. There's kind of a, di a diverse uh, set of ways this has been used, so it's rather misleading to refer to it as uh, any singular thing in that fashion, rather than just uh, any kind of singular identity in that fashion, rather than focusing on the, on the practice. Um, secondly, and perhaps more importantly, uh, it's uh, somewhat anachronistic, and it uses, it draws from uh, a modern term which was made for, you know, as a, as a modern identity used by, used to describe modern practices. Um, the main issue is that in, whereas in our instance, 
Whereas, whereas in our case, there's kind of two genders. There's uh, usually socially acceptable. There are uh, you know the masculine males and the feminine females. Uh, in the case of the Byzantines, there was a fully established uh, third option. So these uh, so these uh, these eunuchs were in fact who the saints were mistaken to be, rather than typical or full men. Due to their beardless state, that is, because you know, women don't have beards, you know, didn't have beards, every Byzantine man would, so that was, that was clearly what they were. So, um, it's worth a brief detour into, into, kind of, into kind of how, how this differed to Orion. There wasn't a straightforward conception of emasculation in the modern sense of the term. So, having, despite having been castrated in childhood, a lot of these figures could serve as generals. Indeed, because of the fact that they couldn't become emperors, they were often some of the most trusted and uh, therefore the most prominent, uh, the most prominent generals. Um, there were established political positions which only uh, eunuchs could fill, uh, especially within the imperial palace. Uh, and this is this actually had a role in, in the kind of reproduction of this case, in that uh, parents would often hope to advance their sons in their political careers. Uh, by putting them through this procedure. So if you're sufficiently committed, there's a way of kind of getting your kid ahead. Uh, but they were far from a rarity in other, in other elements of Byzantine society, away from the capital, uh, and often uh, ended up in monasteries. Indeed, there's a, an account from a bishop complaining about the disruption caused by their lewd nature, um, which is obviously quite different to our own conception of, of uh, emasculated people. In fact, they're often known as angels, which sort of introduces a sort of um, uh, secondary kind of mediating role to these figures who are already kind of mediating between heaven and earth, uh, as all saints do, and now they're kind of uh, in this position between genders, even though they've transferred. So I think, in, I think as a kind of return to my point, it's, it's quite obvious that, that the term transvestite doesn't, doesn't really uh, do justice to the very kind of complex interplay of, uh, of gender arrangements going on here. Let's see what we've got next. So, um, what I think, to, to speak more positively for a moment, uh, what I think we should be doing is looking for, uh, looking for the mentalities and the understandings uh, each era had of their own, uh, of, of their own, and just uh, examining how they constituted these relationships uh, in their own right. So these, if uh, if there's a, a case of um, castrated kind of former males or unfully developed males before the social role, <laughs> then it's quite difficult for our society to appreciate it, and we should. Uh, shy away from terms which kind of um, suggest suggest modern understandings or kind of clear the distance without fully understanding um, the differences uh, between our eras and theirs. But um, in closing, uh, I would say that uh, history has a, a great deal of use for activists in that all uh, kind of essentialist accounts. Uh, seem to require a kind of ahistorical uh, character to some extent. Uh, so what, uh, what's helpful specifically for queer activism and queer thought is that these, uh, these hagiographical figures feature not as villains or aberrations or unfortunates, but as the very ideal of Christian ethics. Although this should be uh, uh, viewed carefully and critically, as I've uh, tried to outline, uh, the fact that there are positive conceptions of those who've lived beyond the gender norms of their contemporaries is really worth emphasizing. Um, and if queer can be seen as a celebration of human's expression, uh, and, it's, uh, and the fact that although its confinement within gender boundaries is a ubiquitous feature, uh, it's not entirely ineluctable. Uh, and if queer can be seen as the conscious rearticulation of e existing extra binary currents throughout history, uh, then clearly these hagiographical texts, uh, which kind of not only represent uh, gender diversity in, in this way, but consciously celebrate it. Uh, clearly that's uh, a lot of use to us and uh, very much worth considering.